Welcome in to Two for One Drafts, the Friday edition of Two for One Drafts. Austin Gale here with Mike Renner. We've we are going through every single draft class in the AFC. We did that with the NFC on the Wednesday edition of the podcast. If you haven't checked that out, go check that out. I thought it was a lot of fun, Mike, and I think the AFC is going to be equally as fun. I agree. I'm excited to get into it because shit. After this, what do we got? Like, there's there's not much else, there's not much left after this pod, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, we got 2021. <laughs> To update you guys there, we're probably going to drop from three podcasts a week to two podcasts a week, at least for next week. And then we might even slip into one podcast per week, obviously well prepared and, and bring in some interviews and those things. But we just can't be hitting three podcasts a week in May and June, man. There's just not a lot, a lot, a lot of meat on the bone. So we'll go it's going to be us like talking about how our days went at that oh, point. Man, just let's like, not oh, what were you up to? <laughs> All right, well, let's start with the New England Patriots here on this AFC review of their draft class. What pick would you change? for this Patriots team? The Patriots were tough. And while I didn't like love the tight end picks there, you know, back to back tight ends, I get why they did it. And I would have loved to have seen them throw some more youth into their cornerback group. Cause those guys, like they are getting old, like Gilmore McCourty, they're over 30 at this point. So, uh, you know, they're, they're not getting any better at this point. You got to keep looking towards the future. So maybe at that point I would have looked at corner, but the one I really, you know, would have changed is you're in the fifth round, got Justin Rohrwasser kicker, which if you haven't read, Timo wrote that piece, right? About the kickers and that yep. like drafting one doesn't actually matter. They're no more likely than UDFAs to be successful at kicking footballs. So they drafted a kicker in the fifth round when they passed on John Hightower. They did not add any wide receiver talent in this draft. Everyone's banging on the Packers for not adding any. This was a similarly rough wide receiving core last year, and they didn't add any as well. Obviously, they got Marquise Lee uh, in free agency after he was cut. But man, John Hightower goes a handful of picks later after a kicker. You're telling me that a guy with 4-4-3 speed wouldn't look a little better in that offense right now than a kicker? (laughs) I I, I think that one, that's the one I would have changed. I'm with you there. I mean, I think that has the biggest, like, you know, return. I I feel like because John Hightower is obviously going to be more productive than the kicker will be, and it's hard to predict the success. But I think I'm subbing out the two tight ends for Jordan Elliott and Terrell Burgess. Just get, come on. Like, I I didn't like either of those tight ends. I thought they were higher guys, you know, guys that PFF liked higher on the board at those spots. Like, ignore, I'm not going to go back and look at the trades. Jordan Elliott went ahead of them is the only thing. Did he? Did Jordan Elliott go ahead of both tight ends? you, You would have to. Jordan Elliott went after Anthony Jennings. Oh, okay. Okay. No, no, you're right. You're right. Well, I'm so, still training out the two tight ends for, I guess, Terrell Burgess and, and maybe Darnay Holmes. Like, I just think there were better members. Kayvon Wallace goes a little bit later. Like, I think there were better players at different positions. I don't think this was the draft to trade up and go get tight ends in the top 100 picks. That's my my opinion there. I think um, I would have gone a different direction. Yeah, that's right, biggest, I don't see those two tight ends. Like, their upgrades, yes. You had shift for tight ends on this roster, but it's not like, I, I don't see, you know, high end. I, I don't see high end play from either of them. I, I just don't think you have the force need there. If there's one position not to do it, it's tight end. And it's definitely not in this tight end group. I don't know. I just didn't see the reasoning there. All right. Biggest impact rookie. You and I share the same here. It's Josh Uche because of the scheme fit. I mean, he's a great player as well. I think he could have gotten in the first round if he tested and, and played at the senior bowl, but Josh Uche in this, in this scheme, he's going to, he's going to get the, you know, Bill Belichick is going to get the best out of this kid. Yeah. That's the thing. I really love, like where he went. He could not have gone to a better spot. He will be utilized correctly because he's very much a tweener. He's we were low on him because guys in that mold have just struggled in the NFL to, you know, keep the same amount of effectiveness. But I think if you're really, you know, moving him around and not letting, you know, an offensive tackle and opposing offensive tackle get sort of a down to down beat on him. Uh, he's just like, he presents something very different in his quickness and his size than what normal offensive linemen are accustomed to. So if like he's going up against the guard for the first time he sees him, it'll be a changeup. It'll be something that's different uh, for that guard. So I do think that that's going to be a good usage for Uchi. Man, I thought Uchi was really impressive in the pre-draft process, and I'm excited that he landed with Bill Belichick because I think that's where you're going to get his well, best. And with, and with our boy last year, Chase Winovich. It'll be true. The, the Michigan the reunited. Edge group. The, the, the good one, the, the ones who actually rushed the passer well the last couple of years. Not Rashawn Gary. Uh, oh, biggest that, hole. That was the unsaid. That was the unsaid there. Uh, biggest hole 
is still the quarterback position. And what sucks, what sucks about this Patriots team is Bill Belichick's going to have this defense in a place where they're not going to be picking. I don't think they're going to be picking inside the top three, maybe not even inside the top five, because of, regardless of how bad Jared Stidham is, I still think this defense keeps him in games. And I think this offense overall is going to stay on the tracks a bit more so than maybe the Jags, the Redskins, some other teams, you know, even maybe the Dolphins, if Tua doesn't play next year. That's what's unfortunate, because I don't know if they're going to be in this tank for true to uh, take for Trevor race because of how good that defense will be and just how good this team will be. Yeah, they'll be all right. But the quarterback situation is the one where I don't know. Like I have no clue what to make of Jared Sidham. I didn't like him as a prospect coming out and he's a fourth rounder. There's not a big hit rate of fourth round quarterbacks in the NFL. So we'll see about that. I don't think he has great weapons either. Like I said, off the top, they needed, some speed to this wide receiving core. And I don't think they found it anywhere. Like Marquise Lee is probably their fastest guy now. And he's never really been a deep threat, even with the Jaguar. So I'm not sure what to, what they're going to expect offensively, but unfortunately like their secondary is still pretty damn good. Like they're still going to have a pretty damn good defense. If you have Bill Belichick as your head coach in that secondary. So we're kind of in that no man's land where it really comes down to offensive improvements are needed, but they really went heavy on the defensive side of the ball. Once again, Man, yeah, for sure. So, w- w- what's your expectations for this Patriots team? W- w- who's the biggest? Yeah, you already said the biggest impact rookie, but like set expectations for Uche and the rest of this group. Kyle Duggar is someone we didn't mention. I, I-, I don't know. I- I'm interested to know- hear what your expectations are for this Patriots team and specifically the rookie class. Yeah, I think you just want to see those guys see the field. Like you want Asi Asi and Keen to be your stars. You want Anthony Jennings to, I, th- I believe, he's moving off ball linebacker to like outplay. Uh, Jawan Bentley here. You want Kyle Duggar to take over Patrick Chung's role sort of thing. Like you need to see these guys get out to the football field is your big win. Your one, I think, because that would be a good sign if, if they're not, uh, that, that would be worrisome. It's, it's not necessarily though. I, I don't expect a ton of impact outside of maybe Uchi right off the bat. I just don't think the guys they drafted are, quite that ready like Duggar especially uh, I think he might just be a guy who sits on the bench for a year and then we'll see what happens after uh, you know the secondary uh, like Chung or whatever leaves I mean there's some projects here for sure like Duggar is not going to be good out of the gate Anthony Jennings still needs a lot of work Michael and Wainu Justin Her- Heron I mean they, they need some work here I think they're planning for the future Bill Belichick knows how to self-evaluate self-scout he knows this team is not necessarily making a huge push Dude, in 2020. That's, what, that's what I love though it's that instead of being like hey we have to go get a quarterback we have to do whatever they were business as usual. They said, no, we have to fill out our roster. They drafted a ton of guys. You look at this, they drafted what nine guys in this year's draft. They, they, that's for a team that was pretty darn good last year. That's usually the opposite of the way teams go, but I love the strategy for the Patriots and this is setting them up well for whatever does happen beyond 2020. All right. We're on to the Buffalo bills. Pick you changed from this draft class. Dude, it, this one's very easy. It's a guy It's a guy we kept saying during the pre-draft process, Bills need to target this guy. Bills need to target this, this guy. Cameron Dantzler, Mississippi State cornerback, goes three picks after Zach Moss. And now we love Zach Moss. We love Zach Moss more than probably anyone else loves Zach Moss in the pre-draft process. And so I do think he is an upgrade. Zach Moss is over Devin Singletary and can actually catch out of the backfield. But, man, Cameron Dantzler would have been fun in that defense with Sean McDermott. Would have been a great fit. Yeah, I mean, and Zach Moss, too, is just like, you know, Devin Singletary is very similar to Zach Moss, and they're both just force missed tackle machines, but not necessarily stellar athletes. I feel like you have two, just a bigger version. Obviously, Devin Singletary is really small, but, I mean, drafting a running back there when you still have Cameron Dancer, who fits your scheme, who would make a ton of sense for your defense, I, I'm with you there. I think that's a perfect swap for the Buffalo Bills. All right, um, biggest hole remaining for this for this Buffalo Bills team. Or actually, give me biggest impact rookie yeah, first. So I... <laughs> As soon as I say that, I think like Zach Moss probably will make the biggest impact. Like I said, I think he's better than Singletary. So I think he ends up getting a good share of carries there and actually is on the field on like passing downs as well. And so I I think Moss probably makes the biggest impact just because more so because like AJ Epinesa, not really going to see like not an easy, clear path for him to see the field on this Bills roster. So I, I do think Moss is your guy who sees the most time, gets the most touches, that sort of thing. I, I did think this was an overall pretty good draft for the Buffalo Bills after trading for Stefan Diggs. I mean, they add Stefan Diggs, AJ Epinesa is a guy we liked. Get him at 54 was good. 
if they added Cameron Dancer at 86, I would have been super happy with that. And then Jake Fromm at 167 is another mm-hmm. player that I think in that, you know, at 167 is a good pick for this Buffalo Bills team. So not a lot of people are talking about this Bills draft because, I mean, if you don't have a first round pick and you're never going to be like, oh, they won the draft because you didn't yeah. get that high highlight, really, the, you know, the big name. But I did I did an analysis that was on PFF.com this week where it was purely comparing our draft board to the draft slot and the value added, you know, putting the the draft board slot as a pick in the draft. So if you were the third uh, on our draft board, you, you got the sort of wins above replacement of the third overall pick. And then comparing that to where they were actually drafted, those were top five in terms of value over expectation per their picks, per, you know, compared to the PFF draft board. So they added a lot of guys that we were high on uh, with their picks, uh, but just, Again, they, they had such a complete roster that they might not see the field, and then they didn't have that one big guy at the top. So I think it's a really, really good draft, what they had. Biggest hole remaining for the Bills, not quarterback. They really don't have. I mean, shit, this is, this, like I said, it's a pretty complete roster, and that's why these guys don't really have this great path to see the field. But I do think cornerback, if you're throwing out Josh Norman as your starter, that's a hole. Like, that's not, that's, you want to upgrade there. You want to do better than Josh Norman at this point in time. So, I think that's where I would say is the biggest hole. I mean, this offensive line though is also not great. I, not I think it's kind yeah, of like yeah. there's no there's no elite guy. There's no guy where it's like, damn, we have to get you know have to replace that guy. So no, I don't know. Like John Feliciano and Cody Ford it's, on the right yeah. side, like I, those guys could both turn in sub sixty point oh grades next year, and it, I wouldn't bat an eye. They could. It be, would have been nice. It would have been nice to address tackle, but I like Ty and Secchi as a backup tackle. Like I would, what I would do is shit. I would kick Cody Ford inside. I never thought he was his best position was going to be tackle in the NFL. I'd kick Cody Ford inside and start Ty and Secchi at this point. What are your expectations for Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills, and how much of an impact overall does this rookie class on have you know have on them? Maybe chasing a ring now is kind of the favorite in the AFC East. Well, I will throw in Stefan Diggs because that is where their first round pick ended up. Uh, I do think this receiving core they are built like this is. Brandon Bean has done an exceptional job to build out this roster. This is a team on the verge, and it really is like, really is up to Josh Allen. <laughs> you know, it is up to his development. He has to take that next step, and they could win it all. But I do think, like I said, the rookie class. I'm not expecting much. Like I, I'm not expecting these guys to see a ton of playing time. But that's how, that's what you want. You know, you don't want to yes. be relying on your rookies to be coming in and fixing stuff for you. You want rookies to come in and play no more than 300, 400 snaps and develop. So that way, in year two and year three, they're actually contributing to this team, and you put yourself in a position again to add rookies that don't need to play a ton. Because rookies that don't need to play a ton are going to good rosters, and I think the Buffalo Bills have done exactly that. Exactly that in terms of building a good roster, one of which you can't build without a rookie on a rookie or a quarterback on a rookie contract and that window is closing so josh allen if he's going to develop into this you know starter that can take them the distance it's got to be year three year four before it gets that much harder to build up this roster all right moving to the new york jets pick you change i think is obvious because i really like this jets draft after the makai becton pick who would you sub out for becton yeah i mean just tristan worth we were much higher on tristan worth's coming out and graded out a lot better in college you're chasing freakishness at that point. You know, I think Worfs has a, a high level of freakishness himself, you know, to go back to over Worfs. So I, I'm, I was, I'm not saying, I'm not gonna say I'm surprised by that, but that's just where I would have gone. I would have rather had Tristan Worfs at that point. I mean, absolutely. I mean, Tristan Worfs, uh, Jedrick Wills just got taken. If, if Jedrick Wills is still on the board, it would have been Jedrick yeah. Wills. But with Worfs still on the board, I, I would have rather had Worfs. And he, I'm glad you mentioned it because they are obviously chasing freakish athleticism and size and just rare tools. Worfs has that. Like, Worfs isn't the size of a mountain. I get that. But he's still a very, very toolsy prospect in that he brings a lot of great athleticism and size to the table. I would have gone Worfs as well. Biggest impact rookie. I like how you put it in here. It's Denzel Mims. Or maybe Bryce Hall, because even though he's yeah. a fifth rounder, like that guy could start next year. Yeah, it's a rough cornerback group. We'll get to that. I guess I'll just throw it in here. Their biggest hole in that roster is cornerback. Still, they did not really go after it in this year's draft. You know, you got Pierre Desir, Arthur Mollett, Wes Juan Austin. It's it's rough. Bennett Jackson, gosh, the former Notre Dame guy who like wasn't even that great in Notre Dame. Um, they they don't have much, and so Bryce Hall could feasibly start for them year one. I would. Not be surprised whatsoever, but the Denzel Mims is the one that should be like he should hit the ground running. I 
a hope for the Jets' sake and for Sam Darnold's sake because he's again with hey like he's on the older end. This guy's a senior. I think he's going to be 23 as a rookie next year. He's kind of been around the block. He's seen a lot of press coverage. He should be hitting the ground. Should be good to go. And more press coverage than any other wide receiver in the in college football last year. He saw so. I hope for their sake, it's them. Could be Bryce Hall though as well. Have the Jets done enough to build around Sam Darnold to put him in a position to you know see if he can develop to see if he has it with this Jets team? I don't know if they have. That's the thing. I, I think they need they either need Mackay Becton or in most likely, hopefully Denzel Mims to be great right away to to really evaluate Sam Darnold. But if you see Becton look like a rookie offensive tackle and Mims is you know similar you don't have enough around him to know. Like, it's just no one's going to be able to elevate this level of just meh around him in the NFL. Yeah. That's just not how the game works. I mean, it's though. still not a great interior offensive line. Alex Lewis, Connor McGovern, or Brian Winters. Like, Tuma Doga is still largely a, a, pr- project. a project. Yeah, it's not going to be easy for him to start all 16 games if that's what he indeed does and George Fan doesn't start there. Like, this is going to be a very difficult team to win with. And again, it, it puts the Jets in this situation where they can't really find out if they have the quarterback. And that that's just so frustrating because you need to find out as quickly as possible, similar to what the Broncos have done with Drew Locke in terms of we're going to give you everything you need and you better tell us quickly if you're good or not because we've we've thrown the kitchen sink at supporting cast. And I don't know if the Jets have done that necessarily. Yes, they added Mekhi Beck and Denzel Mims and I like the Cameron Clark pick as well he could be a depth piece for them but like this is going to be a tough roster to win with you know specifically looking at the receiving core and interior offensive line yeah it's it's not great I mean the Jets still is a pretty rough roster all around like and then to have your biggest weakness be your cornerback position is never good never good all right Miami Dolphins, pick you change, obvious. Austin Jackson, but who are you subbing in? Josh Jones. I know, I know he went in the third round, but God damn it. He's just, he's good. Straight up good. I, I, I guess I'm staking my reputation to Josh Jones being good, unfortunately, with how much I've hammered this over the past week and a half. But like, I believe it. Like, I, I, everything I've seen points to him being a quality tackle in the NFL. You might not be, you're not getting Tyron Smith. But I don't think you're getting Tyron Smith with Austin Jackson either. So I'm going Josh Jones. I think it depends on what the Dolphins' plans are under center next year. If it's Ryan Fitzpatrick, 16 games, Tua get healthy. I'm going Austin Jackson for Rager or Justin Jefferson. Let that offensive Ooh. line kill Ryan Fitzpatrick <laughs> all you want. But let's add some tools for when we do build up this offensive line, maybe down the road. Maybe they add Josh Jones later in this hypothetical dream scenario. Uh, but let's add some weapons, too. I think getting a receiver in there for Miami would have been pretty awesome to see as well. I mean, all of those players are higher on PFS board than Austin Jackson. We were notably low low on the USC offensive tackle biggest impact rookie in 2020 that's what's tough I've I'm on record as having said I don't think Tua really going to see the field much I, I don't I don't think that's the plan for them and I I wouldn't do that to him you know I wouldn't want to ruin his confidence like that so I'm going to go with no Benogni. I think they drafted him with a sort of starting role in mind they want to go nickel every single down you don't you draft the nickel cornerback in the first round, you're going to want him to see the football field. So I think it's going to be him. And I think in that kind of role, he could thrive, like not having to guard number ones, guarding more of the shiftier guys from the slot is where he excels. So I do think that I think Noah Benagini fell to a really nice spot for him. Absolutely. I mean, Brian Flores, Noah Benagini, and then already having two very good cornerbacks ahead of him. I think this is going to be, he's still a very young player too. Like, I think this is going to be awesome for Egg Benagini. Biggest hole for this uh, Miami Dolphins team. I mean, they got holes still and the quarterback position is still yeah. far from solidified, but like ignoring quarterback, what would you say the biggest hole is here? Just impact pass rushers on the D line. Now they added Curtis Weaver. Love that. Rookie pass rushers is just not, there's not a great track record of those guys outside of like top five, top 10 picks. So we'll see how he does, but I just don't think they have a lot on the interior either in terms of pass rush, like Christian Wilkins is your best option. But after that, like great Davis is never going to rush the passer. Devon God, Chow, God, Chow, Chow, Chow. I like that. One of those two. I've heard it pronounced before. It's one of those two. He's not going to rush the passer either. Uh, I just don't think they have much interior pass rush or even like great edge rush. Cal Van Noy had a career year, but was like nothing before that in terms of how he rushed the passer. So 
Vince Death. Beagle, Kyle Van Oy, Curtis Weaver. I mean, they just yeah, traded yeah. Charles Harris. There is not. This is a very bad pass rushing defense for sure. Yeah. Man, that is tough to see. All right. Um, give me the uh, season outlook for the Miami Dolphins. Best case scenario for these rookies and what you're actually expecting uh, when it's all said and done. Yeah. So they drafted Robert Hunt. And I think a lot of people were projecting him at guard, but they drafted him in the second round and they got two starting guards. So I think he's going to play tackle for them, right? I, I would hope he plays start starts to see the field, but you just want to see those tackles not be liabilities out the gate. You, you want to see them be at least, you know, competent is I think the biggest thing with both those guys, Hunt having come from Louisiana, not great competition, Jackson being young and a project. If, if they start out and it just goes, you know, awful from day one, that's the, that's the worst case scenario there. That's so few guys ever recover from that sort of just taking a beating right out the gate. Uh, but then after that, I think you want to see, uh, you really want to see Curtis Weaver like win one of those starting jobs is my, my take on this. I think you want to see Tua not play at all. And you want to see Curtis Weaver win a starting edge job. And that would be, that would be a successful rookie class for you. Yeah, that would be a huge win. I mean, have Ryan Fitzpatrick or Josh Rosen, a combination of the two played all out next year, get another top five pick next year, and then build this roster up to where when Tua can start in 2021, get you, you have a, a roster. Exactly. Get you a penny soul, man. That guy's awesome for Morgan. Uh, all right. AFC North now. Baltimore Ravens. Pick you change running back. They drafted a running back, so you're going to want to change that pick. But who would you change it to? Yeah, I would I would have gone Julian Aquara there. I think. Yes. I mean, we were talking about Julian Aquara in Baltimore all pre-draft process. Like, it made too much sense. Some speed in that edge group. Much, much better pass rushing project than Jalen Ferguson was last year. Much more athletic. Um, Wait, you didn't like of, Jalen Ferguson's three cone? <laughs> he didn't like his three cone, dude. He kept trying it. Um, he's just a much smoother guy. And he's a guy you can who's far more versatile too. You can do a lot of different things from him from a stunt perspective, from a coverage perspective. He is another chess piece of that defense. So I'm surprised they wouldn't have thought about him in the second round. Maybe they did think about him, but I'm surprised they went running back over him. And then like, could have grabbed Raymond Calais later. Like this, if you're looking for speed at the running back position, which I think that's what the move was here. They wanted a guy to bring a more, some more, you know, home run threat to that offense. Raymond Calais was a four, four guy from Louisiana. When in the seventh round, you could have flipped that sixth round pick. That was, uh, that was James Prochet could have been him. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. <sighs> Biggest impact rookie in 2020. He's Patrick Queen. I think. They, I hope it's Patrick Quinn. Shit, they have nothing, had nothing at linebacker. Like that was the weakness. And you got our second ranked linebacker. And I think, like, again, speed at certain positions translates immediately. Like you'll just be able to make plays that you wouldn't have been able to make before because he runs a four or five at that linebacker core. Now it's not, he might not hit the ground and be like super playmaker and have all the stops he had like in the national championship game, but he'll be making plays that, your linebackers before we're not able to. I mean, Patrick Queen falling to them too. I mean, I've talked about this a handful of times, but it's like the teams that stayed put and waited for the board to fall to them that really benefited in this draft. It's Jerry Judy, the Broncos at 15, CeeDee Lamb, the Cowboys at 17, and Patrick Queen to the Baltimore Ravens at 27 or 28, wherever they ended up picking. Like those are great picks that you did not have to mortgage future draft capital for. And, and I just think the more and more I think about it, and you hear like about the Jason Lights of the world that are trying to trade up with every single team, stay put. Let people get too advantageous. Let people get too, you know, uh, courageous with their or, or overconfident with their evaluation, and let some of these very talented players fall to you. Like Kenneth Murray and Jordan Brooks went ahead of Patrick Queen. No one thought that going into this 2020 draft. And I don't know yep. if the Baltimore Ravens did, but <laughs> staying put put them in a low risk situation. Like at worst, Patrick Queen's gone, and you take the next best player on your board. Yep. But when you're trading up, you put yourself in the situation where. You're putting so much, such heavy expectations on this pick to actually outperform expectation. I don't know. It just makes things difficult. All right. Biggest hole remaining for this Baltimore Ravens team. A very good one at that. I think it's still interior offensive line. Like you lost Marshall Yonda. And I know they threw some resources at it. You got Tyre Phillips in the third, Bredesen in the fourth. But I think that's still, I guess maybe not hole, but biggest weakness on this roster is their interior offensive line. Because I mean, like hole wise, there's not like a position they don't have options at right now. 
season outlook for this Baltimore Ravens rookie class. I think Patrick Queen's going to be awesome. I think a couple of pick sixes and a forced fumble, maybe defensive Ooh. rookie of the year, but it's so hard. It's so hard Given to win. that high-end projection. <laughs> I mean, that. no, 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 no. I'm saying it's just so hard to win defensive rookie of the year. Oh, you okay. Have those. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if he doesn't have a couple pick sixes and a forced fumble, like you're, you're, you're going to be very difficult to win defensive rookie of the year. Unless like, tackles. it's like, unless he leaves league. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. we'll see. But Patrick queen, I think could be very good player in year one. Uh, what's your opinion of the rest of this class in year one? Yeah. I think you want to see either tire Phillips or Ben Bredesen, like win one of the starting jobs, hopefully for Bradley Bozeman. He looks like the weak link along that offensive line. Devin Duvernay, I think they got big plans for Duvernay. They drafted him higher than I expected him to go, 92nd overall. Uh, but I think in that offense, if you're, you know, I think he goes slot running back versatility in that offense. You're going to see some creative stuff with Duvernay. So I'm excited for that. And then J.K. Dobbins, I, you're going to give him the bulk of the carries, right? He's going to he's going to be the lead back in that offense. That's kind of his selling point was that he can carry, you know, 300 plus times and and not lose any effectiveness. So I do think that he becomes their guy right out the gate. Probably a th- I would, I'd expect a thousand yard season from him. Really? Shit, it doesn't take that many carries to get a thousand yards behind that with that rushing attack. I mean, but with Dobbins, you got Mark Ingram, Gus Edwards, Justice Hill. You think they're just going to be second tier backs man Dobbins? Like Mark Ingram was very good last year. I thought, <sighs> I mean, he's 30 years old though. He, he True. just hit True. the plateau. You got You got to start when you turn the 30, play. the knees, or shot, you got calcification in your quads that from all those hits. Yeah. It ain't. It's just it goes. Well, maybe maybe we'll see. I mean, I'm excited to watch Dobbins playing that offense. We'll we'll just have to see. All right, Pittsburgh Steelers here. Picks you change. I did not like the Chase Claypool pick, and we were high on Alex Highsmith. I don't know how much I like that pick either. I, I thought the Steelers team could have gone a different direction. What what, what what would you have changed? So I don't mind the Claypool pick because it's kind of like a big swing. When, so your team, usually when you're a roster that, okay, so usually when you're a roster that's like close to winning a championship, and this is like a fairly complete roster, teams will go like, let me get, you know, I, I'm, I'm weak at left guard. Let me go get my left guard to, to build out a roster. Let me go get a nose tackle because they did need a nose tackle in this draft. But I think they, instead of, you know, hitting that single, that would have been one of those positions. They're like, this guy is a freak of nature, Chase Claypool. We don't know what the hell he is, but he could be he could be something just that we haven't seen before. He could be an elite tight end in the NFL. Let's take a big swing at a position that can move the needle for us um, instead of just trying to build out this roster some more. So I don't hate it from that perspective. I probably would have gone to either change that clay pool pick where they were to someone like Josh Uchi or Willie Gay, some athleticism to that defense, some speed to that defense, some versatile guys who can bring the blitz. And if you had if you have Willie Gay and Devin Bush, you have the fastest linebacking core in the NFL. You can cover a ton of ground at that position. You have Josh Uchi as your th- in your third down packages to already with TJ Watt and Bud Dupree. That would have taken those to the next level. So that's where I would have gone. But again, I, I don't think I hate the Claypool pick as much as you do, even though I, I'm not Claypool's biggest fan at all. I think I would have subbed out maybe Anthony McFarland Jr., the Maryland running back for Curtis Weaver. I mean, but you can just do that every pick in the round four for any team because we were just higher on Curtis Weaver. But I also think like throwing multiple resources I like at McFarland pick, to be honest, though. Really? You like McFarland? Yeah. Talk to me more about that. He's got speed. I mean, he brings speed to the table. And again, speed on its own can impact games. And, and they, they don't have, gosh, what was, what was, uh, was what's his face coming out of pit? He's like a four six something guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and James so, Connor? James Connor. Yes, Jesus Christ, I am just zilch today in the memory department. But yeah, James Connor is not explosive home run guy. Jalen Samuels not explosive home run guy. You have now an explosive home run guy. It's just a different dynamic that a guy like that brings. That I, I thought change like it's easy to say change pace back whatever that role. I, I think that's something that. I would have, I think he's going to actually add value to them. And that's why biggest impact rookie, I think it could even be him. Biggest hole remaining for this team, nose tackle. It looks like something that, yeah. that's what you have highlighted here. I think Pinacini would have fit in pretty nicely. He went right off. So the Colt, or where did he go to? The Colts? They, whoever got him, Pinacini, I should know this because it was a great fit. Pinacini went to the Lions, excuse me. They, they uh, got Love him right fit. before, right before the Steelers in the sixth. So, uh, that would have been nice, but 
yeah, nose tackle, Daniel McCullers. It's just the dude can't move. I can't believe he's hung around this long. It was in the 14 draft. I remember him coming out and I'm like, ah, oh, man, he like, he, he couldn't run sideline to sideline. And then Chris Wormley, who they traded for, he's not a nose tackle. So no. they, they're kind of bereft of that position at the moment. All righty. Season outlook. What are you thinking? I mean, the, the Chase Claypool, obviously you said it's a big swing, but you don't imagine him having a huge impact yeah. as a rookie. I think what's, what's, what's more interesting is what is he actually going to play? Is he going to be a tight end, move tight end, slot? Do they want to play him outside? I think figuring out what he does will be interesting. I'm also interested in, you know, with your, you know, you liking the McFarland pick, like, do they have a little thunder and lightning with him and James Conner? Like, if, if that does add enough juice to that offense, I know running game is something that the Steelers want to kind of lean on for sure. Yeah. That's the thing. It's I don't know the role for all these guys. They might another team where the roster is so complete that Highsmith's just going to be a rotational guy. Claypool might not even be able to break into the you know rotation at wide receiver. He might be in the tight end group, which again they got Vance McDowell there. Ebron he might not see the field much. That's why I said McFarland might get the most play. But I think you're more looking for guys from last year's draft class or guys. Yep. who are young on the rookie contracts, those are the guys you need to see take a step forward, especially that wide receiver, Deontay Johnson, James Washington. That's what I'd be looking for if I were them. I mean, if they can get Juju to bounce back, Deontay Johnson to take a step forward, James Washington, you saw some flashes last year. Like, those are the three guys that if you – and obviously Big Ben being healthy, but, like, those three guys, you know, really taking steps forward each of their own and then Chase Claypool maybe fitting in bits and pieces. Like, this Pittsburgh Steelers team is a playoff team, like a very good one yeah. at that. So I think it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how those wide receivers, you know – pan out Cleveland Browns pick you change for the Cleveland Browns the pick that I would change for the Cleveland Browns is actually the guy that went another one that went right after him Jacob Phillips they drafted in the back end of the third round I would have rather had Malik Harrison there the Ohio State guy right down the road an easy scout for a Cleveland there you, based go. Team. you get the fan base a little riled up you sell some jerseys but and it's not just that I just think he's a better athlete I think he's better in space now, both were kind of limited in coverage and the role they played in their respective defenses. Didn't make many plays on the ball, but I think Harrison at least has the athleticism to do it at the NFL level. Dude ran a sub-7-3 cone. You know how much I love a sub-7-3 cone. So yep. that's where I would have gone. That's the pick I would have changed for them. But, man, we're we're – Small potatoes here with how great their first three picks were. Exactly. I was, you can't change any of the first three picks. Jedrick Wills at 10, Grant Delpit at 44, Jordan Elliott, a PFF guy at 88. Like Those are three very, very good picks. I'm pretty sure we gave this draft an A-plus in the draft grades. Yep, that's correct. I mean, an A-plus draft for this Cleveland Browns team, it, it's when you get to pick – when you when we're trying to change pick 97 and 115, you usually had a pretty good draft or you just didn't pick that high in this draft. Uh, wh- who do you think has, is, has the biggest impact in 2020? I think it's going to be Wills. Just impact over what they had on the roster sort of thing. They got n- zero options at tackle. They had you know nothing going for them at tackle at the moment. I think that he will be a massive value at left side. At the left side. And, I mean, and, and watching Baker last year, if he gets more protection, it'll yeah. put him in a better spot too. I think getting Jedrick Wills at 10 was a huge win for this Browns team. Like, I mean, talk about the board falling to teams like Jedrick Wills at 10. I didn't think it was going to be possible. I thought there were going to be teams that would scoop him off off the board, specifically the Arizona Cardinals. I was surprised that they went Isaiah Simmons over Jedrick Wills. So the Browns in a good spot there to get him. Our biggest hole remaining on this team. I'm not sure it's necessarily a hole, but I, I don't feel great about their linebackers heading into this year. You got a lot of just like shit thrown at a wall, basically, with Sion Takitaki, Mac Wilson, now Jacob Phillips. Uh, they also added BJ Goodson uh, over the course of the offseason. I'm not sure any of them are like actual like good linebackers at this point. Is the this is the kind of the scary thing about that group? All right. The biggest thing with this team, though, is where is Baker Mayfield in year mm-hmm. three? Because I mean, they did a great job with the first three picks. You love Jordan Elliott, uh, Grant Delpit, and Wills, but like, it's all for naught if Baker Mayfield can't get back to what we saw in 2018. I mean, he's probably somewhere in between what we saw in 2018 and 2019, but in between that is still a very good quarterback, potentially a top ten quarterback in the NFL. With what they did in this draft, what they did this off season. Do you think Baker Mayfield gets back to that level or at least close to it? That's the thing. And it's the pass pro that starts a wills to hit the ground run. And they Jack Conklin to be the guy we saw last year. That can happen. That that's the case. I think you can see this team. I mean, compete for a playoff spot for real in the North. Man, that would be, I mean, we need Baker to come back. PFF is so big on Baker. <laughs> can Baker bounce he back? He staked a lot of rep rep. 
Dude, to him. so much rep. So much rep. All right, Cincinnati Bengals, pick you change for them. I mean, you've said this before, but like Logan Wilson, the Wyoming off ball linebacker, with Josh Jones still on the board, we wanted him at 33 for the Cincinnati Bengals. They were able to get him again later in the third. Like, I think Josh Jones for Logan Wilson's the obvious situation here. Oh, to abandon their O line the way they did. I just would have loved just being like, hey, Burrow, you know, we just drafted you number one. Here's all offense, you know, the next three picks. Just like give him everything he wants. Like that sort of thing would have been sweet. But uh, Wilson's a fine player. Like uh, he's an upgrade over what they had on their roster. But God, Josh Jones would have just like, you got Jonah Williams, Josh Jones on the right side. You would have serious, you know, the protection could have a chance next year of holding up instead of, Eh, not being great. Although I do think Akeem Adinaje could in time help that offensive line as well. So I like that pick. Maybe on the interior. I think that's where he's probably best holds up that guard. All right. Biggest impact rookie for the Cincinnati Bengals, Logan Wilson, maybe one of their day three picks. Yeah. I, I mean, this one's got to be Mark <laughs> Haley, the seventh rounder, right? Stop. Joe B. Yeah, yeah, Joey. He's he has to be. I, yeah. I think I'm just going to say it. I think he has a Baker Mayfield esque rookie season. Calling it right, the shot oh, right wow. now. Wow, that's a good one. Just like that's a very good rookie season. I think he looks good. Like I think he straight up looks like he belongs from day one. Man, that would be impressive, and that would, if a season does happen, that would send Stop people. Stop saying to, if the season does happen. We're not. We're not going to allow that. That's on fair. Show. That's fair. All right, biggest Before hole. Season happens. Biggest hole remaining for the Cincinnati Bengals offensive line. Yes, this is another like duh. This was like the easiest draft breakdown of all of them. Um, offensive line. Yeah. You have God, Billy price still. If he, I don't even know if he's going to start anymore. You got Michael Jordan at guard position, Trey Hopkins at center, Xavier Suafilo, who, I mean, was a, was cast away by a Texans offensive line. That's how bad he was. And then you got Bobby Hart at right side, which no need to say, although he actually did grade out better towards the second half of last season, Bobby Hart. So maybe that's why they ignored tackle altogether, but uh, it's just, there's, there's a lot of, lot of question marks, you know, it could go very, very South. Once again, you just said that, you know, Burrow could have a Baker Mayfield ask year one. That's setting expectations high for this rookie class. Cause even, throw all the other rookies they selected out the window. If they get, you know, Baker Mayfield ask year one out of Joe Burrow, this is a huge win for the Cincinnati Bengals team. In addition to that take, what's your take on the impact of T Higgins, Logan Wilson, and even some, maybe the other off ball linebackers. They did take Akeem Davis gave I believe. And also uh, Marcus Bailey. They took some other good players in this draft as well. I, I mean, they're going to unseat the linebackers there. I would hope in Jordan Evans, Jermaine Pratt, Pratt, maybe in year two, he just looked out of his depth year one, but Jordan Evans, he's has chances. Dude's not good. So I think that, You want to see those guys. I think Logan Wilson starts in day one and is pretty solid in what he brings to the table. So, and I think actually, God, I think I see Akeem Davis Gaither beating out Jermaine Pratt as well, if he's healthy. Like He was a better than a fourth rounder. He slipped because of that bone on bone in his knee, but that's more of a long-term issue than it is right now. Dude, I, I got high hopes for this Bengals man. You're getting excited. You're getting me excited right. about the, you know, the former worst team in the NFL. Joe Burrow is going to make a big difference. All right. on to the AFC South. I did not like this Houston Texans draft. I, I think they've kind of gotten better in a you're, lot of different ways. What picks would you change here? You're not alone. This was so in that graphic I tweeted out from, gosh, I forget who made it about the grades of everyone else's grades all combined. They had the second lowest like average grade by the media. And I, I would change a lot of their picks to be honest, but the one where I just like, don't see Charlie heck, North Carolina tackle. I don't see it. I, I don't think he can pass protect in the NFL flat out extreme waist bender like struggles just to have that flexibility that I think you need to pass protect and it didn't do well at the senior bowl. It's straight up. Like didn't do well in North Carolina this past year It's just too tall. Like he's like almost like six, eight. It's don't, don't think that plays in the NFL. So I'm going to say I would switch him out for Jack Driscoll. If you're drafting a guy like that, I mean, you're, he's a swing tackle. You, you have two tackles right now that were first rounders when you just paid a, shit ton of money too so heck is either a swing tackler guard i think if you're going swing tackler guard jack driscoll was quite easily the best option on the board at that point the I, i'm super guy. surprised that you didn't pick the black lock pick at 40 or, or grenard i think what 90 in this draft i, I thought maybe well, you'd sub those guys what's your, like what's your I opinion of those two picks specifically so black lock actually of all of them is the one i don't mind i think he could be an impact player 
I, I don't think he's, he's not DJ reader. If you're expecting him to be DJ reader, he's not that type of player. He's more of a gap shooter. Whereas reader like could control blocks. It was a powerful dude, but I think he's still good. But the greenard one, I don't see it. I, and again, and again, the guy, just like said, Jack Driscoll is why I don't think Greener's good. J- Jack Driscoll is <laughs> lunch pass. Bro. Like, that's right. That's right. I had people, God, I had Florida fans all up coming all at me. Cause I did, I wrote all, least up in you? Uh, all up coming all up at me because okay. I wrote a least favorite picks uh, for each team oh, and that's most right. favorite picks for each team, least favorite picks. And there was like, I think there's three Florida guys on that list. And I, I got called a Florida hater, even though I have like zero connection to the school, but the greenard one, they were like, Oh, you know, what you don't know is that he was hurt during sec play. He looked great before that. And it's like, yeah, he looked, well, I, one, I knew he was hurt. And two, he looked great before that. Cause he faced, uh, Bad like tackles. T. Martin and the the freshman from Miami who was basically a uh, was a tight end two weeks before that game. So, yes, a lot of guys were going to look great before that. And going back to even like his Louisville tape was not good. So and he wasn't a good athlete. So drafting a guy like that in the third, I don't see it. So what's who do you think has the biggest impact from this class? David the Johnson, big, the biggest <laughs> impact. <laughs> I think Blacklock. Has the biggest impact. I think John Reed, though, I'll say, could compete for that starting slot role for the Texans. We'll see. Ooh, I, and you know I like John Reed. I mean, John Reed, the Penn State cornerback, super smart guy, super athletic. I, I, I like him a lot. All right, what are your expectations for this Houston Texans team? I don't see Ross Blacklock, Jonathan Grenard, Charlie Heck significantly moving the needle. This is all on Bob and Deshaun Watson, like getting this done with the receivers they have in place with Kenny Stills, obviously no longer DeAndre Hopkins, Will Fuller. Like, do you think they can, this can be a competitive team in the AFC South? Is this the favorite in the AFC South? Or do you think the Colts have kind of taken over? I think they're just going to regress. It's another thing. Like when you go up and down their roster, you got to tell me a spot where you know, they're going to be better than last year. Now getting JJ Watt for a full year, that probably improves you a little bit, but what other spot are they definitely going to be better? They're going to be worse than their receiving core. Even with Brandon Crooks, I mean, Brandon Cooks. <laughs> their, I don't know why I said Crooks. <laughs> their secondary is like same guys as last year and injury has, injuries. And the like, offensive line, though, like, it's, you know, they've thrown the kitchen sink at it in terms of yeah. resources. It's still bad. Like, I know you spent a first and second That's round not pick. Bad. It's just like fine. Yeah, I don't know. Titus Howard, Max Sharping, Zach Fulton, like Larry Tunsil was good last year. I agree. I get good, but like I don't know. Like it's tight. It's gonna be. It's gonna be rough. I, mean, I still think Deshaun Watson's gonna be under pressure. He he welcomes his pressure rate or invites pressure too. Like it's gonna be very hard for this offense to perform, especially now that you're, you're without DeAndre Hopkins, easily your best player from a year ago. Like this is gonna be a tough season for a Texans team where I would look at the Tennessee Titans and say they got better. I would look at the Colts and say they yeah, got better. Jags guys, are the- trash, but like. I don't know. That's the division tough, improved man. as well is the problem. Yeah, that is the problem. All right. Speaking of the division, we're on to the Tennessee Titans here. What pick would you change? I put here Isaiah Wilson, the number 29 pick, for, and Darrington Evans, the App State running back, for Noah Igbenogany and either for, for Darrington instead, Terrell Burgess, Curtis Weaver, Alex Highsmith, any of those guys. I just was not high on a running back at that spot, specifically not high on Darrington Evans. Yeah, well, you can't. Re, can't redo their entire draft class here. You get, you I, try, I was thinking about it. I was thinking moving about it. and shaking here, but no, I, I get, I get the thought. I would have just the Isaiah Wilson ones. The one I'm just like, I would have gone anywhere else. Shit. Like I would not have gone him in the first round. I, I oh gosh, the guy that was like, we came off the board fairly soon after Isaiah Wilson, LaVisca Chanel. I would have loved to have seen in this offense, LaVisca, AJ Brown, like give you weapons that are dynamic like the, the same thought process that probably went into the Darrington Evans pick in terms of like, he's a little more speed to the table than Jack That'd Henry Jack city, dude, they would have had a ton of playmakers with the ball in their hands. And, and I get that you spent a first round on Corey Davis and that Adam Humphreys, you paid a good deal of money to, to man the slot, but dude, give more weapons to, to giving more weapons to Ryan Tannehill is not a bad thing. Nope, not at all. And I, I, I'm not convinced LaVisca Chanel couldn't do better than Darrington Evans in a running back role. I mean, we've talked about this before. Yes, I think yes. that could have oh, been, if, if you were looking to add a compliment to Derrick Henry, I think LaVisca Chanel could have been that option. Uh, biggest impact rookie is also probably you know, my favorite pick of this class. I mean, of their draft is Christian Fulton, the LSU cornerback. I think they got in round two or round three. I think he can have an immediate impact early doors. I mean, he was a very good cornerback at LSU, battled some injuries, but like I think he's a high floor player, higher floor than some of the other cornerbacks drafted in this uh this year 
Yeah, I think he probably plays slot for them right out the gate. Takes Logan Logan Ryan's sort of role there in that defense. That makes a lot of sense, and I think that's he'll be very good in that. Biggest impact, or no, biggest hole remaining for this Tennessee Titans team? I think it's probably pass rush. Like you, Harold Landry is hoping for a year three sort of breakout for him. He's solid enough though on his side of the ball, but then Vic Beasley, we've seen enough to know it's, I don't think it's going to turn around at this point. And they, they gave him kind of a prove it as a deal, but you need to do better than that. If you're really going to field, you know, a very good defense. So I think that's where I'd call the biggest hole. Yeah. I, I think they need to get better as pass. I mean, as a pass rushing unit, I think their secondary improved like Christian Fulton and like, let's pivoting to like the season outlook and, and setting expectations. I think Christian Fulton's going to be a steal for where they drafted him. But outside of that, like Isaiah Wilson, if he starts next year, just I, what, what I do is go back to some of the bad reps on his tape. Like, I think you're going to see a lot of those against very athletic pass rushers. He faced, I mean, like Josh Allen of Jacksonville in the division, I think could whoop him up pretty badly. I, I mean, I'm just not super, excited about Isaiah Wilson starting anytime soon for this, uh, for this Titans team. Yeah, that's, a, it could look like it, you know what it could look like. It looked like Nate Davis last year who got thrust into a starting role who we kind of even liked. We're like, Hey, third round, I'd take a chance on Nate Davis out of Charlotte. I wouldn't dream of playing him year one because like he's so raw and he's just not quite ready for the speed of the NFL game. But I think he has the tools. I don't want to say I feel similarly about Wilson at tackle because I don't think he has necessarily the tools there to stay at tackle, but it could be like that and where you're just like, damn, this guy's like a liability and what are we going to do to protect him? Although Davis, by the second half of the season, had like started to figure it out, but it still ended up with a 46.6 overall grade. Like you just can't have that starting at tackle. That's that's far more impactful at tackle than it is at guard, in my opinion. I mean, er, having your starter earn sub 50.0, you know, PFF grade in year one uh, is not going to be good. Like that, like you said, is going to be a liability and make this team significantly worse. Like you can't have that bad of a weakness at tackle. And yeah. I think they could with Isaiah Wilson. I just don't see him hitting the ground running. I do think they go super play action heavy, super run. Oh, heavy yes, year, absolutely. They Mr. have to protect Cole. him. Similar yeah. to how like, Orlando Brown Jr. kind of has to be protected. But even though I think Orlando Brown is a, is a lot better prospect than Isaiah Wilson, I, I still yeah. think he's going to have to get protect, protected. Well, he was a lot better in college, yeah. Yeah, true. All right, Indianapolis Colts. Picks, I'd change. Jonathan, I went Jonathan Taylor for Trayvon Diggs. It, rather than taking the running back, even though I think he's going to be super productive, I feel like there's a good chance he wins Offensive Rookie of the Year if Joe Burrow doesn't have that Baker Mayfield season you speak to. like I, I think adding Trayvon Diggs in the secondary would have been awesome. See, I'm... <sighs> I, I'm fine with the Taylor pick. I, I don't, I know I'm going to get shit on PFF. But like, this okay. is a, this is a very complete roster that Taylor, I think actually behind that offensive line will be, there's something to getting your rushing offense to a level where like no one stops it. And I think they could get to that level with the Colt with Jonathan Taylor and, and that offensive line. That's how good it is. And so uh, I never thought Marlon Mack was anything special. Naheem Hines, like those guys are kind of just guys as runners. Jonathan Taylor has everything to be a good runner behind that offensive line. So I think Jonathan Taylor, I'm not going to change that pick. I'm going to change Julian Blackman in the third for a guy who tore his ACL in the championship game for Adam Troutman, the tight end who the Saints ended up trading up for because I think Troutman fits what Philip Rivers throws to. Like Philip Rivers has loved tight ends over the course of his careers. He is thrown to those guys. You got a big body in Michael Pittman. Give him another big body and a tight end. You have Jack Doyle there. I think that a guy like Adam Troutman and his receiving ability underneath would have played in that offense. Yeah, that's actually not a bad shot. And tight end position is something that obviously Philip Rivers has loved over the course of his career. Biggest impact rookie, not Jonathan Taylor, though I think it could easily be from a box score perspective. But Michael Pittman Jr. is going to be a dude for this Easy. offense, in my opinion. Easy money. He could be in the rookie. We call them in the rookie of the year conversation think it's real he's gonna need some touchdowns i mean it's such a, like it's kind of a it's kind of a popularity contest in the form of box score stats like you just need touchdowns mm-hmm. you need yards those things like Pittman could rack it up with philip rivers under center biggest hole for this Colts team Colts team left i put pass rush maybe even secondary i still think there's some just guys at both those both those spots i think they could have gotten better there yeah they have options at least at each i think their nose tackle position grover stewart maybe they're another hole in that roster, but I think they have options at least at cornerback safety. Obviously the linebacker is pretty strong group. This is another roster where 
they kind of filled it out to a degree where there's not any glaring weaknesses. That's good for this Colts team. I mean, if they're if they're if they're going to try and push, you know, in the AFC East, uh, what are your expectations for this rookie class in year one? I think the expectations is big. Like this, has, this is a rookie class with high hopes, and it's the first two guys. The rest, you kind of like Julian Blackman. They have two starting safeties. They're not even going to put him in as a starter. Like even when he does come back, I don't think so. It's those first two guys, Michael Pittman and Jonathan Taylor. They need Taylor to be a 1,500-yard type of back, and Michael Pittman to be a 1,000-yard type of wide receiver. And I think there's reason to believe like that could really happen. Do you think uh, – what, what do you think Marlon – what happens to Marlon Mack? Like, what happens to Marlon Mack now that Jonathan Taylor's added to the mix? Dude, I, I, I think when they drafted Jonathan Taylor, they have him being a bell cow sort of back in mind. I truly wow. do. You don't like target Jonathan Taylor and that skill set. Unless like part of his is one of his biggest selling points is that he just carries the rock 25 times a game and doesn't lose any effectiveness is like one of those guys. Oh, we get stronger as the game goes on sort of guys. That's Jonathan Taylor. If you wanted, you know, a, if you wanted like a certain running back skill set, like a, a cam Akers to be a complimentary back, you would have gone that route. But you draft Jonathan Taylor if you plan on giving him a bunch of carries a game. The, the other question I have about this team is, is can this secondary hold up? Like Malik Hooker has had injury concerns. Julian Blackman's coming off a significant injury. Xavier Rhodes is coming off burns, like Bad literal third-degree <laughs> third burns the previous year. Rocky C needs to develop. TJ Carey has been a career slot guy, safety guy. I don't know if you want him playing outside corner. Like, is this sec- – I know you like Marvell Tell, the, the former fifth-round pick at a USC, but, like, is this secondary good enough to hold up against the best of the AFC? I don't know. Mm-hmm. That is the thing. They're kind of just, they're not like, there's not one guy. They play a very good scheme there though. And they protect their guys. They rely a lot on that, but they don't have a guy like a hang your hat on it sort of guy, but I don't think they're super weak anywhere either. Like they're kind of, they're kind of exploring our low weak link theory of pass coverage where it's, you're only as strong as your weakest link sort of thing. Yeah. All right. Jacksonville Jaguars pick you change. I put Curtis Weaver in for Shaq Quarterman. I think you could change some of their early picks, but like, I really like this idea of them buying into guys that won't be great in year one, but could be great in year two. Like I didn't want to make any of those changes. Like, yeah, I think Caleb on chase on probably a bit of a reach compared to who they could have gotten. But in terms of what this team's trying to do, this team's trying to get Trevor Lawrence. Like this team is literally trying to get Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields next year. So drafting a player with a higher floor in year one, I don't think was the strategy. I was going to, I'm willing to buy into that, move on from Shaq Quarterman, the, the, the Miami, Florida linebacker and bring in one of our favorites, Curtis Weaver at that spot. Yeah, the quarterman pick didn't fit with. So we thought there was like this overall theme of get young athletic guys who can, you know, maybe not ready right away, but then we'll push down the road and are these sort of, you know, quote unquote upside guys. And then quarterman is just like an old school thumper who can bring a little blitz as a linebacker, but it's just limited in space. So that one never really quite made sense to me where they drafted them at 140. I, I would have liked to have just seen them, to be honest, try to fortify uh, some offensive line, like just keep throwing resources at when you're at that point in the draft and you're building, like the more you can have depth and quality along your offensive line, the better set up you are when you do get the guy at quarterback, you know, now is yep. the time. Cause they're, you know, quarterbacks, not this year. It's as much as we love Gardner Minshew. I don't think even they think he's their future at this point. The, the future is Trevor Lawrence. The future is Justin Fields. Hopefully. And so just throw some more resources at that O-line to make it good and injury resistant when he comes. Biggest impact rookie. I've said that LaVisca Chanel very well could be a bust for among top 50 picks because of the injury concerns and how much this guy's been hurt over the past few years. But I also think if he's healthy, because I mean, that's still in the range of outcomes. He plays 16 games. He's the biggest impact rookie in 2020 because like Gardner Minshew can get the ball in his hands within five yards of the line of scrimmage and what he does with it will be special. I think LaVisca could be awesome in year one. I agree. I think he's the biggest impact rookie too. I wouldn't, I'd almost, so I, I have the same take about Tua as I do with Visca though, where it's like, I'd almost give him a little red shirt year. You know, don't, don't utilize him to his fullest capability this year in terms of like scheming him the ball in his hands, giving him some wildcat stuff, that sort of thing. Like let him, let him develop on a full route tree. Let him run the outside stuff and get better at that and not really pump him the ball. But then next year sort of take the training wheels off and let it rip. 
That's not a bad take. I don't hate that take at all. I, I think that's smart. If anything, biggest hole, I put quarterback. And I like Gardner Minshew. But this quarterback, just limited from an arm talent perspective, is just not going to take you forward. I also think it's like veteran presence and experience. Like, this team is young. This team doesn't have a ton of, like, blue chip types of talents, guys that you can lean on year after year. I think they need to get they need to get more experience. They need better talent at quarterback if they're actually going to make an impact, you know, uh, uh, in these upcoming years. Yeah, I would also add safety to that list because okay. I don't think Gerard Wilson and Ronnie Harrison are great at this point. All so right, safety, my ex- go ahead. Brian Cole. My my expectations here for this rookie class it, it all rides on Minshew, like how good they are in 2020. All rides on Minshew and the development of their young players. Like their DJ Chark needs to continue to get better. This rookie class obviously needs to continue to get better, and I think they have other Jawan Taylor, Cam Robinson, guys they've invested in at the tackle position, like. You need these guys to develop into the players you thought they were if you're actually going to be able to continue to build around them, if not completely strip it down. Like you're going to have to add new tackles if Juwan Taylor and Cam Robinson don't start to show it in year two and year three, respectively. Like that's that's where we are right now. It's development season in Jacksonville. Yeah, it's going to be so interesting to see exactly what they do. Like they, I still can't believe they haven't traded Yannick Ngakwe or like done something with him at this point. But what leverage do they have? Like, what leverage does the Jacksonville Jaguars have in training him? Like, the team, they're like, yeah, we want a first round pick. It's like, no. And well, like they, it's like, not a first round pick. Like, I'm saying you, they should have just like taken anything at this point, is why, is what I'm like surprised about that they haven't, because he's even said he's not going to play for them. That's, you're kind of sitting on a, an asset and it's depreciating by the day the closer you get to the draft, or Man. excuse me, you know, after the draft and now the closer you get to the season. And the sort of you know, learning curve for him is more. So I'm very surprised that they haven't moved on from him. But, but I is, not, like, is, is Yannick Ngakwe not playing for you in 2020 more valuable than trading him away for like a fifth, sixth, seventh round pick? I don't know. <laughs> like, Because he's going to be good for that other team. Like, I, I, obviously, that's kind of absurd to even think about. But like when it got to the point where the teams were saying, yeah, we'll give you a fifth, like. I don't know how, like, I'd rather call Yannick's bluff. I'm like, dude, uh, like a fifth round pick for this guy who's been proven a productive pass rusher. Like, I'd rather keep him on the bench and maybe he turns his, you know, turns over. We release him as a free agent and get a third compensatory pick. But if he doesn't play, they don't get that pick, I believe. That would be a concern for this Jags team. All right, let's move to the Chiefs. Wait, wait, I had one more take, though, about the Jaguars. So weird, the dynamic in terms of you have a lame duck head coach in Doug Morrell. Like, there's no chance he makes it through this season, right? they're not going to win games. They have a be- objectively bottom three roster in the NFL. And this is Marone's what? Fifth Ooh, year there, fourth year are they there. eyeing somebody? Are they, like, are what are they, they eyeing a young buck at the collegiate I was level? Say, like, they have someone Lincoln in mind Riley? that they didn't want to move on from that, them last year. Because if you, if you take their draft strategy to the coaching position, are they sitting and waiting to maybe pull the trigger on like a Lincoln Riley or a young and upcoming, I don't know. That's a good call, actually. Because Doug Marone, like, what are his expectations? Go win eight games with Gardner Minshew? Like, no, yeah. you're not going to. Like, with this draft class, not a chance. Man, that's but, that's a good conversation. And to then have. the other thing is, like, you've got to throw these guys on the football field, these rookies. I don't care. I don't care that DJ Hayden is there as the starter at the slot cornerback. You got to put Josiah Scott in. Like, you got to let those young guys see the field. Because DJ Hayden's not part of your long-term strategy for winning a championship. You know, you're, you're the guys you got. Chris Conley is not part of your long-term strategy for winning a championship. Throw the Visca Chenault in there. Uh, you know, guys like that. Caleb on chase has got to see the field as a rookie. Don't have Yannick and Gakwe playing over him. If he does start to play like get Caleb on chase, in there, get those guys. Yeah. Get those guys on the football field as soon as possible. Ben Barch uh, over AJ can get him out on the field. Let's see what you got in these guys. Don't, uh, you know, don't play for all in on this year with, you know, maybe even if those rookies aren't as you know good at right out the gate as the guys, maybe they're starting over. All right. Kansas City Chiefs, picks you change. I put Clyde Edwards Hilaire, the 32nd overall pick, for either LaVisca Chenault Jr. or Jalen Johnson of Utah. Those are the two guys that I would have rather had at 32 than Clyde Edwards Hilaire. They're saying Damian Damian, uh, Williams is going to start and Clyde Edwards is going to compliment. That pushes me even further in the direction of go get a guy that could start for you or have a better impact in year one, especially for a team that's literally just won a Super Bowl and should be looking for impact players, high impact players like I think those other two guys are. Yeah, a cornerback would have been nice here. Just as like some insurance to 
to that defense. And now and Jalen Johnson, like specifically for that scheme, I think Jalen Johnson would have been awesome. I, I think yeah. Jalen Johnson makes a, I mean, if you don't want to go after LaVisca, I only put LaVisca in there as like, if they're dead set on adding to the offense, specifically a guy that can catch the ball out of the backfield and, and be good with the, you know, um, after the catch, LaVisca was the guy over Clyde Edwards Hilaire, in my opinion, but like mm-hmm. cornerback weight made way more sense, especially with how the board fell. Yeah. Biggest One of the things I actually <laughs> said on, I was on Kansas City Radio the other day and the interesting thing about the Clyde Edwards Hilaire pick is that a year ago at this time, if you had to draft this running back class, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is probably like a fifth, sixth rounder. And Anthony McFarland, who went in the fourth right before they picked Legereus Sneed, is probably like a second or third rounder after he had like a monster sophomore year. Or I guess it might have been his redshirt, redshirt freshman year. But now, it, you know, Clyde Edwards Hilaire goes into a ideal situation for a running back to produce this past season. Anthony McFarland doesn't has, I believe an injury that hampers him throughout the year. doesn't have nearly as big of a year falls off sort of the draft radar. What are the, like, can you tell me with hundred percent certainty that, you know, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is a much better back than Anthony McFarland at this point. Like, is he for sure a better back? Like, do we know that? Or did he just have a much better situation? And so I would have yeah. rather just had like, I would have rather used that pick they traded up to go get the curious keys, go back in the draft to get the curious keys to move up in the fourth and get Anthony McFarland and draft a real deal cornerback in the first round. than praying Legere Sneed develops into something at corner in the fourth and drafting Clyde Edwards. I agree. Biggest impact rookie for me, Willie Gay Jr. Mississippi state off ball linebacker. It's going to be great to see him play more than 200 snaps for the first time in a while. I'm excited. Agree on that one. Biggest hole remaining for this Chiefs team. And that's the thing. They got some holes on this roster. Yes. They're they're not not, as complete as you'd think. (laughs) Yeah. Interior offensive line is kind of just hodgepodge. They, they put it together every year because they're well coached, but they're, they're not great up front by any means. Um, And obviously outside of Frank Clark, they got no one on the edge rushing position either. So we'll see. Dude, tough situation for the Chiefs. I think they could have gotten so much better at 32 if they didn't go after a running back. I don't care if he's Brian Westbrook and Priest Holmes combined. I, I just think <laughs> it would have been smarter to fill some of those other holes. I, I, some of the expectations or outlook for this rookie class I put in there, it's going to be interesting to see how Damian uh, Williams and Clyde Edwards split the touches. It's also going to be interesting to see if you see any philosophy change with that. Like, are they going to try and get the running back involved more when you have Miko Hardman, Sammy Watkins, Tyreek Hill down the football field and Patrick Mahomes? God, I hope not. Cause I thought their offense was fantastic in terms of how aggressive they wanted to be last year. I'm excited for Willie Gate jr. I hope he plays a full season, doesn't punch any quarterbacks in the face. And I oh, also yeah. think I was looking at metrics recently, like Nicole Hardman was very, very productive on a few amount of opportunities last year. Are they going to try and find ways? And I know he does a lot of the same things Tyree Kill does, but are they going to find more ways to get him the football? Because I think he was so good with the ball in his hands last year or when he was targeted that I think it makes sense to try and, I think, boost his role a little bit, even by 25, 30%, get him more involved in the offense because he was just that good last year. Yeah, uh, I, I do think, Nicole, they kind of, they'll have him see in the field more this year than... Uh, he did last year for sure. This the offense is going to be good. Like there's no doubt about that. It's more the defensive side of the ball I'm worried about. Like Legereus need they need him to make an impact. That sort of thing. Like right from day one because the corner position Rashad Fenton, Shavarius Ward, uh, Rashad Breland. It's it's not as bad as it looked on paper heading into last year, but it's not. This isn't like good. Like they are lucky that. Deshaun Watson was the only quarterback like that p- could pass that they faced last year. And like it took a just Herculean uh, offensive performance to stop that from, you know, torpedoing their Super Bowl dream. They, they really sort sort of caught an easy route of QBs after that for them. So uh, they're lucky to play in the AFC because the NFC, I don't think they would fly with that secondary with all the QBs in that conference. All right. Moving quickly here, Denver Broncos. I put picks I change here. Michael Ojemudie, I think at 77 for either Jordan Elliott or Neville Gallimore. I think they could have got a better at interior defensive line, specifically one that could you know rush the passer at a high level. Yeah, I, I actually, I can get on board with that. They needed cornerback. So that, I think that's why they went Michael Ojemudie and he fits their scheme. But I also, I don't know. I'm not sure if I would have changed the Albert O pick. Cause like the more I looked at that, the more I'm like, damn, like that's a scary just the fact that he can run a four, four, nine again, and you got a tight end that can run a four five lining both of those guys up and you have an entire, you know, you can go four, two tight ends and two wide receivers that are all faster than four five is pretty like 
that's a, it's a scary four or five or faster is like a scary proposition for opposing defenses. But I still think it was kind of like a luxury pick and would have loved to have seen them double up at corner to see if they can get hit at that position. Biggest impact Johnny. rookie. Is it not Jerry Judy? It has to be Jerry Judy. He's I mean, come on, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry Judy or KJ Hamler, whoever Drew Locke likes more. I, that, that's probably where it's going to go. But I think Jerry Judy is going to be that guy. Biggest hole for me. I've been saying this all off season, but how we're so willing to say Drew Locke can be the guy in Denver. I don't know. I still think he's a huge question mark. Yes. They've done such a great job of building around him to answer that question. Like I've said this before too. I think they're going to find out if Drew Locke has it by week six because they have so much talent around him. The offensive line still isn't great, but like the receiving position and tight end, you know, Noah Fant, Albert Okui Boonham, like they have talent for Drew Locke. If he can't get it done, it's not a them problem. It's a him problem. And I think um, it's still a question for me, but th- there still are other holes on this roster. Where do you think the biggest hole is? Yeah, I, say, I think they went, I'm not sold on Drew Locke either, but I think they went about this off season was good. I think that's the way I would have done it too, with that he showed enough. Yes, you can go take another swing at QB. Uh, I wouldn't have done it in the draft, though. I think if I was going to address QB, I would have gone and like kicked the tires on a Jameis Winston to be a backup, that sort of thing. Maybe an Andy Dalton to be a backup. That's where I would have gone. But I'm fine with the way they're just like, hey, we're not going to like go try to draft a quarterback again. We're going all in to give him the weapons needed to succeed. So I like that. Uh, I do think that probably their biggest hole, I mean, another linebacker after Alexander Johnson, and I just don't think Josie Jewell is quite it, but we'll see. I like Josie Jewell coming out of Iowa. How freaking dare you, man? I feel like he could be pretty good. The cowboy, if you will. Um, the expectations I said, I, I put in here, Drew Locke, ride or die. Like it's yeah. it's like either win, you know, fight or flight here. Like either you win with this team or, or you're not able to rise to expectations. I also thought, like, can this defense be average? Like the cornerback group is bad. Like the secondary is going to need help. I know they have a great defensive mastermind in Vic Fangio, but like, can this defense really get back to being average to above average? Because I think the offense could be good, all, all of course, riding on Drew Locke. Last thing here, it was Natani Muti and Justin Sternod, guys that have battled injuries of late but uh, uh, but have been productive in bursts. I think developing those guys, getting those guys healthy for year two of their respective careers, I think is going to be something good to watch when you get on to 2021 with this Broncos uh, squad. I think they had a good defense last year, didn't they? They were good. But I think yeah, they, but like, they, they lost Chris Harris Jr. Though I, yeah. I, I, I I'm I'm nervous about so the second. Bouye, they get Cal Ham back. I, I think they'll be. I think they'll be very good. And obviously, I trust Vic Fangio a lot. I think he's a very good defense coordinator. So uh, I, I do think that side of the ball is not what I'm worried about. It's really? more rookies, rookie wide receivers just never quite, never quite hit the ground running as fast as you'd think. It seems like. And so even though I love Jerry Judy, like. It might not be the guy. It just might not happen. Day one is the thing I'd be worried about if I was a Broncos fan. Now I love Jerry Judy and I think it will for him, but a lot of people have been wrong about wide receivers before. All right. Two teams left on the AFC review here. Let's we'll start with the Las Vegas Raiders pick. I change Damon Arnett for either Jalen Johnson or Jeff Gladney. Like if you were locked in the cornerback, I almost put Caleb on chase on in there. Like I almost would have rather had Chase on the Damon Arnett, and we weren't as super high on Chase on as a first round pick. But I think if you were going to go cornerback, I'm going J- Jalen Johnson or Jeff Gladney at that pick. Yeah, that one's an easy one to change. And dude, the more I look at it, like I don't love the Lynn Bowden fit. No, I don't either. 80. Like I don't even like Terrell Lewis, but he came off a few picks later, and I'd rather have Terrell Lewis in that edge room right now than. Lynn Bowden, I don't know. It's like you have to back up running back. You just draft it with the top 80 pick. Ah, that, so, yeah, there are a few picks that changed, but I agree on the, the biggest one probably would be the cornerback at the top. Biggest impact rookie. I, I have Henry Ruggs. Got and it. I think it's either it's either going to be biggest impact because Derek Carr can't take advantage of him and it just derails this entire offense, or he actually lives up to expectation and they get he they get him, you know, 80, 100 targets and he produces a high level 10 plus touchdowns, like really, really breaks this offense and for the better. I think it has to. Like it, right? It, he has to force Derek Carr to go downfield. It's it just that's kind of why you drafted him over everyone else is because John Gruden, he had to have a plan for that speed to be utilized and for Derek Carr to, you know, open it up to a degree. So he has to be the biggest impact. Biggest hole remaining for this Raiders team. <sighs> yeah, I think it's still their defensive line is still kind of rough. Like we love Max Crosby. Great rookie year. No questions with him. <sighs> love Maurice Hurst, but like 
the edge pressure outside of Crosby, you got no one you can necessarily count on after them. You got Nassib, Farrell, Furl, excuse me, Arden Key, guys who are just guys at this point. All right. Uh, season outlook, rookie expectations. I put in like they need third year leaps. They need Colt Miller, <laughs> Brandon Parker, PJ Hall, Maurice Hurst. They need those, Arden Key. They need those guys to step forward. And for second year leaps, they need the, the, the other guys that they picked in 2019. I'm blinking, but I have these names mapped out in my head. But like they made some questionable dis- uh, Cleveland Furl, Jonathan Abram, Josh Jacobs to really have an AJ, not AJ Terrell, the other Clemson cornerback, Trayvon Mullen to take second year leaps. Like they've, this is the year for John, the marriage of John Gruden and Mike Mayock to like step forward. Like you, you've invested in Derek Carr, you, you continue to kind of put build around him. This is the year you've had your way with the last two drafts. Can you get the best out of the players you selected? A lot of them being from the outside looking in, consensus reaches. Are you going to be able to put it all together with Derek Carr under center? Because you're going to need significant development from the guys you've drafted over the past two or three years. I think that's the biggest thing. Like you look up and down this roster. Every single position is either a free agent signing from from Mayock or a highly drafted guy from Mayock uh, or Gruden and or a guy who was actually good already on the roster that was a holdover from a previous regime. And that's like that's like Rodney Hudson. That's Gabe Jackson, those sort of things. So this is his roster like this is what you assembled. You had all your time. You had all your picks and, you know, all these picks that you you flipped Clue Mac for and all uh, this cap space this is what you assembled. So there's almost like, there's no excuse. It's like, this is the, this is the put up or shut up year for that regime here. Or if it doesn't happen, I think Derek Carr ain't QB there anymore. I'll say, Oh man, this, I mean, if there's ever a make or breaker year, it's this year. I mean, they've given him Henry Ruggs. They've added that offensive line. They made Trent Brown, the highest paid offensive tackle. Like they've done everything they could to build around Derek Carr, like Derek Carr. It's like put up or shut up at this point. All right. Last team, Los Angeles chargers pick. I change. I changed Justin Herbert into Jedrick Wills, and I changed Kenneth Murray, the two picks they gave up to go trade up from, for LaVisca Chenault Jr. and Jonah Jackson. It's that simple. And this Chargers draft is so much better. I, I, I think that's where I would have gone. Stuck with Terod Taylor in 2020. No, I wasn't going to compete with Patrick Mahomes. And then with the top 10 pick I grab next year, go attack the quarterback position. But forcing it with Justin Herbert, especially you hear Tom Telesco valued all three of these quarterbacks top, drafted in the top six. He would have made Tua a Charger if he was available on the board from what he said to Pat McAfee. Like, I... I think it would have been smarter to move away from the quarterback position, maybe even trade down and try and build up this roster because like, yes, they were a quarterback away, but I don't know if they were that quarterback away, that Justin Herbert away from being, you know, a playoff type of team. Since you're doing the fun, like let's revamp their whole draft strategy ones. I'm going to do one too. So I'm going to do, they, they don't, they don't take Herbert at six. They answer Jason Lick's call to move up. They trade back down to 14. Boom. They still get Tristan worse, obviously, because they probably would have moved up and, oh, no, maybe they don't get tackled in that situation. They get Josh Jones in that situation. They get a left guard. They move all the way down. Then they get a second, an extra second rounder out of that. And then they turn that second rounder, which was pick 45 that the Tampa Bay Bucks selected Antoine Winfield with. And they turn that into KJ Hamler. Who says Here we no? go. That's, that's <laughs> fire. I'm all in. <laughs> That's that's the move. I, I, and then I'm, they sign Jameis Winston the next day after the draft or Cam Newton. One of those two. Oh, I mean, Cam Newton would have been great. Like if he can't start like for the first four weeks because he's still hurt and you're able to start to Taylor. But then Cam Newton comes down the stretch like this Chargers team could actually be good, especially yeah. with that draft class you just mapped out. All right. With that being said, they didn't draft those guys. They drafted yes. Justin Herbert and traded up for Kenneth Murray. Who's the biggest impact rookie in year one? Oh, man. I think it has to be Herbert, right? But. Hey, I don't, I don't know if it's gonna be good. Like, I don't know if he actually even starts either. They might th- roll with. They yeah, he's got. Tyrod. It's funny right now for him to start week one. Like, it's still the expectation, at least according to Vegas, that because I mean, they straight up Tyrod straight up started over a number one overall pick. How is he not gonna start over number six overall pick, who we thought was you know worse? Although, I don't know. We'll see. I, I don't. I don't love the impact of maybe either of those first rounders. We're obviously not high on them, but I think Herbert's the one who probably has the more, a bigger impact, if it, even if it may not be positive. Biggest hole remaining for the Chargers, I have offensive tackle and interior defensive line. Yeah, I mean, they must love like Trey Pipkins from the third rounder last year or awesome. Sam Tevy. I, I don't know, but yeah, it, it is their offensive line. 
guards week, like Dan Feeney has not been good over his three year career. One of the worst guards in the NFL pretty much every single year. And then tackle still an issue. We'll see how they do there, but that's the biggest hole for me. All right. Last thing here. What are your expectations for the chargers and this rookie class in 2020? I just think the offense is going to be bad, man. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, even if it's Justin Herbert or Terod Taylor, it's not yeah. going to be great. I love the defense. The defense is loaded with talent. That's why I would have gone elsewhere at the quarterback position, a guy who's more NFL ready than a Justin Herbert. So I, I just worry about that. Unfortunately, I was already like, I was talking to myself onto this Chargers bandwagon once again, and then they went Herbert. Now I'm, I'm firmly off feet around the ground. I still have a lot of negative. I have a lot of negatives in my outlook. I think Kenneth Murray will not hit the ground running. I, I think he could struggle in coverage. But I did say Joe Reed, the Virginia wide receiver, running back type, and KJ Hill are both fun wide receivers that could. They are fun to watch Hashtag. in twenty twenty. Like Joe Reed's fun to watch, and KJ Hill, he did see a ton of press at Ohio State, but he did at the Senior Bowl and, and beat some cornerbacks down in single coverage. So Dude, I think it was comical. Was it was comical how how little Philip Rivers passed to anyone else. Not, you know, any of the third wide receiver there in that yes. offense last year. I think Andre Patton had the lowest yards per route of any receiver in the, in the, like the NFL last he did. year. He did. That's, that's <laughs> and it correct. wasn't even like close. It is. It was a placeholder. All right. That's going to do it for the AFC review, man. That was a ton of talking. I think we went a little over an hour or whatever it was. A ton of good stuff there though. Next week, we're going to do two podcasts next week. I was thinking Mike would do a little preview of the 2021 class. Yes, sir. Let's go. Draft season never stops here on 2 for 1 Drafts. Until next time, Austin Gale, Mike Renner, 2 for 1 Drafts.